If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, comment, and subscribe to my YouTube channel, as well as follow me and subscribe to me on all my other social media platforms. What's up, Thrashers, and welcome back once again to the Thrash Maniac 99 YouTube channel, and I am back with another discography ranking for you guys. This time, we are actually back to talking about bands that got voted on in the community tab on my YouTube page, and this was the result of a poll I had months ago, but I took a break from it to do a couple of bands that I wanted to personally talk about, such as Blood Red Throne and Typo Negative, but this was the result of a poll I had that was themed Evil Death Metal. And the bands that were in question were Deicide, Hate Eternal, Immolation, Incantation, and Vital Remains. And, well, the band that won is the band I'm talking about. And so for today's discography ranking, we are talking about one of the legends of the Tampa death metal scene. And that is none other than Deicide. So... Deicide, interesting one to go over, considering my history with this band kind of goes back a little bit towards the end of my high school days. This was around the time whenever I was getting more into death metal. Like, already by the time sophomore year had come around, I was already into bands like Cannibal Corpse and Death and Morbid Angel and Obituary. Deicide was kind of like the next logical step to go after those bands, and... Really, my history with this band is a bit complicated. I am a fan of a few of their albums, at least in the beginning. But other than that, it's just like, a good chunk of this stuff I didn't care for at the time. And the biggest reason why I've never been the biggest Deicide fan is because, lyrically, they have some of the most redundant lyrics I've ever seen. It's like, the whole theme is just anti-christian satanic blasphemous hatred stuff and it does get a bit tiring after a while i mean i don't mind people singing evil lyrics but when there's no like story being told about or you're singing about this stuff in a creative sense take a band like morbid angel or behemoth bands along those lines that do this kind of theme i prefer their style because they're more creative with it Whereas Deicide, it's just kind of, it's just the whole thing of like, oh, I hate Christians, they all should die, and blah, 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 blah. Granted, it's all tongue-in-cheek, but still, give me more imagination lyrically, that's all I ask. I mean, not to say that there isn't, and we'll talk about some of those when we get to some of the albums. But other than the lyrical themes, musically, they are a very solid band, it's just, I will admit... And we'll get to some of these albums when we get to them. They do kind of have a rep of having some, like, paint-by-numbers albums or albums that they just phoned in and didn't really give a shit about. But there are other albums that are absolutely fantastic, and we're going to touch on those when we get to them. So, yeah, my history with Deicide, a bit complicated. So, there you go. There's my whole spiel about Deicide. But with my history of the band out of the way, let's get to the actual history of the band. So Deicide's origins go back to 1987, where two brothers, Eric and Brian Hoffman, who are about a year or two separated from each other age-wise, were individually getting into playing guitar, but were on completely different paths, uh, influence and music-wise. Eric, he was more into... The classic stuff, Black Sabbath, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Led Zeppelin. Meanwhile, Brian, on the other hand, he was more getting into the more extreme stuff coming up at the time. Bands such as Bathory, Sodom, Slayer, and Destruction. Basically, he was really into what was coming up in the underground around the mid to late 80s. Eric didn't really want to have much to do with it in the beginning, but at the same time of Brian getting into the extreme stuff, in high school he met one Steve Ashim, who came into school wearing a Metallica vest, and Brian thought, eh, you know, this guy seems pretty cool, and then they started hanging out and they liked the same music, and then they started to jam together, and then they tried to get Eric to come in because they had their instruments in Eric's bedroom. And Eric was like, come on, guys, stop. But Brian's like, come on, let's play some death metal. And Eric in the beginning is like, that shit ain't gonna make no fucking money. 
But then, as Brian and Steve kept pestering and pestering Eric, Eric got into death metal more afterwards and decided, you know what, this is some really good stuff. I want to be a part of this. So early on, the Hoffman brothers and Steve formed a band called Carnage, not to be confused with the Swedish Carnage that was more known. But this was a very short-lived band that they had early on, and somewhere in 1987 they were going through newspaper ads and they found an ad from a bass player and vocalist who was looking for musicians that were into bands like Venom and Autopsy, those kind of bands. And so the Hoffman Brothers and Steve Ashim got together with one Glenn Benton. And the rest, they say, is history. Glenn joins up with the Hoffmans and Steve, and together they form Amon, or Amon, actually. That's more like it. And Amon, this would be a band name that would last for a couple of years, and even had some demo material recorded in 89 that would eventually eventually be re- re-released called... Uh, oh god, what the hell is it called? Even I forget my notes sometimes. Fe- Feasting the Beast. That, I thought that was what it was, but I just had to double check. But regardless, so they had some demo material made, but then somewhere in 1989 they decided to change the name to Deicide. And think it's stuck, because Deicide, that is an evil name. After all, do your research on what it actually means. Now, sometime in 1989, this was around the beginning of when death metal was really starting to take hold in the underground. You had labels like Metal Blade, Earache, and Roadrunner Records signing up death metal bands left and right. And Roadrunner was the big one out of the three that was getting the most bands onto that label around the 89-1990 mark. And there's the infamous story and the rumored story. I don't know how true it is, and I don't even know if it's true, but... I guess until the day Glenn Ben decides to tell tell all about it, I guess we'll never know. But the rumor has it that one day Glenn Ben stormed into Monty Connor's office and said, Sign us, you fucking asshole. <laughs> and then a couple days later, DSide gets signed to Roadrunner Records. Now that sounds like a very far fetched story, because I really don't think that was true, but if it is Holy crap, what a way to get signed. You just barge into the owner of the company's office or the A&R guy of the company's office and just demand they get signed. And then two days later, they're signed. So if it's true, what a way to do it. Now, DSide would be on Roadrunner Records and would go to the studio in 1990 and work at the legendary Moore Sound Studios with one Scott Burns. And released in 1990, we get the debut album, Deicide, the self-titled. This is my number one. It's all downhill from here. But stick around. There are are still some great albums to talk about. But yeah, this self-titled album, I've had a connection with this album musically for years. Granted, it's been a long time since I listened to it up until getting ready for this ranking. And wow, talk about catchy hooks on this album. Even though it's brutal as fuck. Like, the guitar tone was just, ugh, nasty sounding. Basically, this album took what I think Morbid Angel was doing, but made it a lot more nastier, a little more blackened. Like, you could argue this is a building block towards blackened death metal, because there are so many riffs on here that just scream black metal. Like, the tremolos, some of the blast beats you get on here are very black metal, but you get a lot of death metal tremolos and death metal blasts. And the thing that I always liked the most about this album was the vocal layerings that they were experimenting with. And the best way to describe the vocals on this album is what would happen if a demon was being possessed by another demon. Because Glenn's just doing all this crazy high and low stuff. Like, he can do the guttural growls just as good as anybody at the time. But he's also doing the black metal shrieks. And sometimes they would mix them together to give it that, like, demonic, like, possession kind of thing. But song-wise, I mean, top to bottom, this is a hell of an album. Like I said, there's so many catchy riffs and hooks. Songs like uh, Carnage in the Temple of the Damned, which kind of break away from the whole blasphemous thing. And it's more about uh, 
Jim Jones, and then you got, of course, uh, Lunatic of God's Creation, all about Charles Manson, Dead by Dawn, which is based on uh, Dawn of the Dead. But then even the blasphemous songs like Sacrificial, Sacrificial Suicide, uh, Oblivious to Evil, Blasphyrion, The Song Deicide, Crucifixation, top to bottom, this is a hell of a death metal album that kind of is more blackened to death before blackened to death became a thing, just because of just the vocal style at times, some of the riffing and the blasts, very much scream black metal. But I mean, this is a tour de force, and this is definitely one of the best early 90s death metal albums ever created. And it is my number one. So the band would go on to tour all over the world, mainly in America and in Europe. They got to go over to Europe as early as late 1990, like in England and I think even Germany. But they got to tour all over the place pretty early on, which goes to show you how legendary this album became pretty fucking quick. Now for this next album, they decided to kind of change things up. As once again, they would record with Scott Burns. This album would be recorded in late 1991 and released in early 1992. We get Legion. This is my number two album. It's almost as good as the self-titled for me, although it's very different tonally and songwriting wise. Like this is a much shorter album. Like the self-titled was like 33 minutes and some change. This album is about 29 minutes. And the reason why it's so short is because they got a little bit faster on this album. They got a little bit more kind of thrashy. But the big difference, I would say, songwriting-wise, from the self-titled to Legion, on Legion, they got a little more extreme and a little more ferocious because they got more technical. Like, there's a lot of technical riffing going on here. Like, to the point you could call this blackened tech death because i mean technical death metal was just starting to find its leggings in the past couple years you know you had like atheist death uh nocturnus and pestilence kind of coming up with some more of these technical death metal lenient stuff deicide with this album they kind of in my opinion went even more technical than say death and pestilence maybe not as technical as nocturnus or atheist but more technical than Pestilence and Death, in my opinion, because, holy shit, a lot of these riffs, it's like, how in the hell can anybody play some of these riffs? Like, the Hoffman Brothers just got out of hand when it came to the songwriting, but songs on here like Satan Spawn to Kako Demon, Dead But Dreaming, Repent to Die, uh, Trific... Uh, God damn it. I can never pronounce this song right. Uh, Trifiction... There we go, Trifiction, that's right. Uh, Revocate the Agitator, just top to bottom. This is another brilliant album, but for very different reasons. Like I said, the self-titled was filled with more hooks and a little bit more melody and catchiness. Here, they were going for much more of an extreme, ferocious, technical vibe. And that's why these albums are like the perfect yin and yang for the uh, Deicide discography. And it is my number two. Once again, heavy touring going on for Deicide going forward up until they would go back to the studio. Sometime in 1994, they would get back to the studio and for this next album, which would be released in April of 1995, we get Once Upon the Cross. This album is my number four. I'll be honest with you, I always kind of looked at this album as being a bit overrated because coming off of the self-titled and Legion, it just kind of screamed like, eh, it's like the third part of an unholy trilogy of Deicide, and it's always going to be seen as the weakest. And it still is the weakest out of three, but my perspective on this album has completely changed after giving it a bigger chance in preparation for this ranking. And I will say, there are some more... This, this album kind of feels like part two to the self-titled a little bit because it goes back to the more catchy songwriting. There's more hooks coming back. Um, maybe it's still not as much melody as the self-titled. Like, it's still retaining that more ferocious extremity of Legion, but bringing back those catchy hooks from the self-titled. 
I mean, the title track that opens the album is a damn good song. When Satan Rules His World will probably feature in one of the catchiest death metal riffs of all time. Kill the Christian is a really brutal track. Uh, confessional Rape. <laughs> Uh, to be dead. I mean, yeah, top to bottom, this is another brilliant album. It's just I do still feel it's a tad overrated because I don't think it's better than another album that I'm going to talk about later on, which I'm really excited to talk about when we get there. But it doesn't take anything away from this album being great, and it is my number four. So moving on from there, once again, more touring going on for the band. And then after all those tours, they would go back to the studio in 1997 and released in late 1997, we get their fourth album, and that is Serpents of the Light. This one is my number five. I actually really like this album, and this would end up being the last album produced by Scott Burns, and you could kind of hear he was on his way out with the mix on this album like songwriting wise this is awesome like songs like blame it on god this is hell we're in slave to the cross the title track i mean top to bottom songwriting wise i actually think the songwriting on this album is better than once upon the cross but it ranks lower than once upon the cross for the reason being the production wasn't the best like the drums not the best sounding drums, and then the guitars felt a little bit gainy and a little staticky and at times a little bit uh, squawky, but it does kind of give it a bit of more of that black metal charm. Like, this is another album you could classify as black into death metal because it kind of mixes a little bit of, like, the guitar style, or, the, not, or not the guitar style, guitar tone of black metal and a bit of the drum tone of black metal with the songwriting chops of death metal. And, yeah, like I said, top to bottom, when it comes down to songwriting, like, this is almost like the perfect amalgamation of the first three albums. Like, there's some technical spots, there's some blackened spots, there's some cool chugs, some catchy hooks, and it's still extreme and ferocious. It's just the mix wasn't the best, the guitar tone... While I do appreciate it for feeling more of into that black metal realm, compared to the guitar tone you had on the first three albums, yeah, it's not the best tone you could have on a DSI album. But, like I said, songwriting is awesome on this album, and it is my number five. So after what I would consider the golden era of DSI with the first four albums... Now we're going to start getting into a period in Deicide's history where, well, <clears throat> not a whole lot of things are starting to make sense, and I call this the Dark Ages of Deicide, because, yeah, this was around the time when Roadrunner was starting to gravitate towards new metal, and they didn't really give a shit about the death metal bands anymore that they had. Deicide, I think, was like the last of that initial death metal gold era for Roadrunner Records that was still there because of contractual stuff. Like, they were contracted for six albums for Roadrunner, and you could tell, like, Roadrunner just did not care at this point. And it's not the fault of Monty Connor. The people in charge of Roadrunner was starting to kind of take over and kind of push away a lot of the stuff that people loved from Roadrunner. And it's definitely apparent with this and the following album, as for this next album, they would stay at More Sound Studios, but would get uh, Jim Morris to come in to do the production on this one. And released in June of 2000, we get Incineratum. This is my number 11 album. This album is very much like... There's going to be a section of albums here where it feels either paint by number or uninspired. This album is the better of the two albums that I feel were very uninspired as there were only a couple of decent songs on here like Bible Basher, the opening track, The Gift That Keeps On Giving, and Refusal of Penance. Like the opening, middle, and closing tracks were solid for what they were, but the rest of the songs just felt like, I don't know what they were going for songwriting-wise. It's like, and even in the guitar tone, like, they tuned down to D 
which is very weird to hear out of Dia's side, but definitely hearing a couple of riffs on here, I can definitely see how it would inspire a band like Blood Red Throne, and I absolutely love Blood Red Throne. And there are some riffs on here that do kind of remind me of them, but with, when it comes down to Dia's side, it's like here... They got too indulgent with breakdowns and slam parts. It's like, I don't know if they were into bands like Devourment at this point. I highly doubt it. But it's like there was just way too many breakdowns, way too many slam parts. And just this job, this album is just very uninspired. Apart from the opening, middle, and closing tracks, you could honestly skip this album and you wouldn't miss it to be honest. And even lyrically, they kind of got a little bit away from what they were known for. Like the song Forever Hate You, it's essentially a fucking breakup song about Glenn. It's like, ugh, we already went through this with Massacre and it's like, we don't need it again. <laughs> and it happened again when it came down to this. It's just, ugh, lyrically, very bad songwriting wise. Paint by numbers, uninspired, contractually obligated, bullcrap. Yeah. Number 11. Never listening to it again. I didn't think it would get worse than this until we get to the next album. And speaking of which, after this album, they would go back and do a small tour and then go back to the studio in April of 2001, once again with Jim Morris at the helm of production. Now, you could tell DSI just did not give a shit at this point because this album was recorded and mixed in four days. So it was just like, uh, let's just get this done and over with so we can actually move away from Roadrunner because this would end up being their final album on Roadrunner Records and released in September of 2001, we get In Torment in Hell. First of all, this album is dead fucking last. Second of all, what the hell is up with the artwork? Like, did some kid paint that? And then third of all, the biggest reason that this album is terrible is because Roadrunner rushed them to finish the work on this album, which explains why the artwork is poor, and the sound of this album is terrible. And even in the songwriting, like, you can definitely tell this was a contractually obligated album because, good God... All these songs just fucking blow chunks. Like, I can't think of one song off of this album that has anything to it. Like, ugh. Like, honestly, if I were to redo the top 10 or even top 20 worst metal albums of all time, this would be up there on that list because this is a terrible album and even the band don't like it. So this is kind of one you can't really make fun of too much. Because they were rushed to finish this because Roadrunner just wanted to get their contract done and over with. And the band didn't give a shit, so they're like, okay, here's an album. Now fuck off so we can go to a better label that will actually treat us better. So, yeah, that's basically the story of this album. Uninspired, paint by numbers, and just... Well, actually, I shouldn't even say uninspired. Well, actually, no. I shouldn't even say it's paint by numbers. Blah! Paint by numbers, English motherfucker, can you speak it? I shouldn't even say it's paint by numbers. This is just terribly mixed, terrible songs. Just nothing about it was good. Like, there's no redeeming quality to this album, and it will remain the worst DSide album ever made. Unless they somehow can top it, which I highly doubt, but yeah. Fuck this album for even existing. So now that I got that out of the way, so now that we've gotten out of the dark ages, finally, out of Deicide's career, now let's get back to a little bit more good stuff, because after their contract with Roadrunner was finished, they would eventually sign to Earache Records and would be on there for the next three albums, and they would get back to the studio in... Uh, excuse me, <laughs> late 2003, and eventually released in February of 2004, we get Scars of the Crucifix. 
This time around, Neil Kernan would come in to do the production. And of course, if you know anything about Neil Kernan, he's done a monstrous list of artists and bands that range from, I'll just name two, Hall and Oates to Nile. There you go. So, a Hall and Oates uh, quote, or not Hall and Oates quote, mentioning Hall and Oates. God damn it, I am stumbling today. Hall and Oates in a DSI video. But hey, it's what happens. Now, Scars of the Crucifix, this is my number seven album. I actually think this is a pretty solid album. Of course, the big problems with this album is that by this point, tensions were starting to mound between the Hoffman brothers and then up, up against Steve and Glenn. But still, and then the other big issue with the album, the dr production, even though Neil Kernan produced it and I like his production, this one didn't really feel that well done. Like, the guitars are very squealy and squawky, especially the lead tone. But And, like, even the drum sound, not the best. But the songwriting on here felt like Deicide. This actually felt like old-school Deicide. Like, this almost feels like uh, Serpents of the Light Part 2, almost. Songs like the title track, Scars of the Crucifix, Conquered by Sodom... Uh, Enchanted Nightmare, the Pentecostal, and even Go Now Your Lord Is Dead, which was the short song of the album in under two minutes, but it is a brutal two minutes. But, uh, yeah, the big issue, of course, production, but songwriting, really solid for what it is, even though tensions were starting to come up and about, and maybe that tension's felt in the album, that's why this album feels so aggressive and just brutal. And it is my number seven. Now, to continue on with the theme of the Hoffman brothers up against Steve and Glenn, like I said, there were tensions mounting around the time, and then eventually the Hoffman brothers would end up leaving the band, vacating the guitar spots. And after doing a couple of tours, we would actually get two new guitarists who are masterminds on the guitar from different bands. We get Ralph Santala, who came from Death, Obituary, and even Sebastian Bach to be on guitars, to be on the first guitar, and then second guitar, well, <laughs> they would get probably one of the best guitarists in the history of death metal, and that is Jack Owen, formerly of Cannibal Corpse. Like, he had left Cannibal after the Wretched Spawn came out due to just not feeling it anymore in the band, and six months after he had quit... He joined Deicide and would be in the band for quite a long time. So, two amazing players coming into Deicide, and they kind of felt revitalized here. And for this next album, once again, Jim Morris at the engineering helm, but Steve Ashim would actually do the production. And then, released in August of 2006, we get the almighty Stench of Redemption. This is my number three album. Holy shit, did this feel like a true revival of Deicide. Scars of the Crucifix was a solid album, but this, this revitalized Deicide for a lot of people. Because of the addition of Jack and Ralph, no disrespect to the Hoffman brothers, they were great players, but Jack and Ralph far better than the Hoffman brothers when it comes down to overall guitar chops. And it shows because this is where you start to hear where Deicide are now. Like, there's much more melody going on here that enhance, like, the leads, like, melodic leads, and even a couple of moments during the riffs where you get some melodic backdrops. And that's what you get top to bottom on this album. Songs like Desecration, Crucified for the Innocents, Homage for Satan, which is a brutal barn burner of a song. But this album contains probably my favorite Deicide song of all time, The Lord's Sedition. That closing track, starting off with this like cool, sinister, clean melody, and then into some ripping lead work from Ralph and Jack, and then just after those leads, bam, into the brutality of Deicide we go. Crazy blasts, crazy thrash beats, more insane leads, and Glenn, like, Glenn's vocals seem to keep getting deeper as he gets older. And, like, this 
his gutturals were really low, and even his high black metal scream still very much there, and it's just... Ooh, I fucking love this album. Absolutely love it. Definitely, hands down, out of the three Earache albums, this was the best one, because holy shit, this album just completely changed the game for them, and it is my number three. Now, moving on out of Stench of Redemption, uh, they would go on tour, even doing the uh, Doomsday LA Live DVD in 2007, and then they would get back to the studio in 2007, and then released in April of 2008, we get their final album on Earache Records, Till Death Do Us Part. And this is interesting, because this is the longest Deicide album. This is over 42 minutes, and yeah, this one is my number 10. I do like a couple of songs on this album, like the uh, opening and closing instrumentals in the beginning of the end and the end of the beginning. Those were cool. Uh, even Horror in the Halls of Stone, the longest track of the album, and I think the longest Deicide song as a whole at nearly six and a half minutes. It's a pretty good song, but aside from that, this is where it, this is like the tail end of the paint by numbers section of the Deicide catalog. Like, this album, I get they were trying to go for a couple of different ideas, like incorporating a little bit more doom metal into their sound, because there are a couple of spots on this album where it does slow down, but it didn't really work out for me. And also, the production kind of fails again in my mind, and just not my favorite sounding album at all. But, yeah, this album, once again, paint by numbers, despite them trying to do a couple of different things, just didn't work out for me, and it just does not capture me at all. And that's why it's number 10. But after that album, they would eventually be off of Earache Records and would eventually sign over to the label they are currently still at, Century Media Records. And good on them, because Century Media is a really damn great label. And they would get back to the studio sometime in 2010. And this time, they would not go to more sound studios. To uh, Till Death Do Us Part was the final album they did at More Sound. Here, they would go over to Audio Hammer Studios to work with Mark Lewis, who has done a bunch of bands, especially in that Florida scene. And released in February of 2011 we would get To Hell With God. This one is my number nine. I thought it was a bit of an improvement over Till Death Do Us Part, but it's still not that great. Like, it's still paint by numbers D aside and just didn't really have much inspiration behind it. And again, not very memorable, aside from maybe the song Savior and perhaps Angels of Hell. But even that's kind of stretching it. Like, nothing really grabbed me about this album at all. Though the reason why it's above Till Death Do Us Part is because this album actually did feel more like Deicide, but not by much. It's mainly in the tone that feels like Deicide, whereas songwriting-wise, not the best work. And it is my number nine. Now... To Hell With God would end up being the final album with Ralph Santala on guitar and coming in to replace him for the rest of the career for Deicide would come guitarist Kevin Quirion, who had already been playing live with Deicide here and there while Ralph was in and out of the band to do work with Obituary in particular around this time. <clears throat> Kevin would join on fully to take over for Ralph and would get back to the studio in 2013 during the summer and released in November of 2013, we get In the Minds of Evil. This is my number six album. I actually really like this album because it's like, again, perfect amalgamation of everything Deicide is about. You get your blackened moments, your grooves, your catchiness, some technical bits here and there, and of course, more melodic leads like this almost feels like stench of redemption part two almost which is good considering the previous two albums not that great 
here I actually thought this was a really good album. Songs like the title track, Beyond Salvation, Even the Gods Can Bleed, Kill the Light of Christ, but my favorite, The Closer, In the Wrath of God. That might be a top 10 favorite DSI song for me because it's got some catchy riffs, cool drum patterns, and really cool lead work. But also the reason why I really like this album is the production. Jason Sukoff would come in to take over <clears throat> for the producing uh, of the rest of the DSI discography, which is one more album. But I love Jason Sukoff's production style. I know some people aren't too big on his clean sound, but I think it helps enhance everything. Like here, the bass is more prominent, and it's just really fun to listen to. Granted, the guitar tones feel a little more like thrash metal guitar than death metal, but it works for what DSI does because there are moments on here that kind of remind me of Vader a little bit whenever they get into that thrashiness. But top to bottom, this is a really damn good album, and I actually might pick this one up because this is some really good shit, and it's my number six. Now, <clears throat> over the next few years, again, more constant touring for the band. However, in 2016... Jack Owen would eventually leave the band, and for this next album, they would pick up monstrosity guitarist Mark English to come in on guitars for this next album, and this would actually be the longest break in between albums, at least as of right now, of recording this video, and five-year gap from 2013 to 2018, because this album released in September of 2018, we get their latest offering, Overtures of Blasphemy. This one's my number eight. This is definitely in the section of albums that still feel very paint by numbers, but this was by far the best in, out of between this, To Hell With God, and Till Death Do Us Part. This was easily the better of the three. And there are some actually some really good songs on here. Tracks like Seal the Tomb Below, Crawled From the Shadows, Excommunicated, uh, Defying the Sacred. Like Those are some really good songs. <clears throat> but other than that, the rest of this album, not really that memorable, and they kind of sounded like they were kind of playing it safe a little bit. And considering it was five years after <clears throat> after In the Minds of Evil, it just didn't feel like they were completely into it with this album. And, and again, with a change-up on guitars kind of felt like this could have been a transition album to what they'll eventually do and yeah it was my number eight now like i said this would be the last album up to this point for dsi as they've been in the studio working on stuff and i keep seeing reports that they're apparently being inspired by prog music for this next album so we could be in for something really good and i don't expect an album to come out this month or in December, so 2023 most likely, and hopefully they've taken their time, especially with the pandemic, to just sit down and write some songs, especially now that they got a new guitarist, Taylor Nordberg, from The Absence, Inhuman Condition, Gorgong, and Massacre coming in to step up on guitars, along with Kevin Quirion. And hopefully this next album, whenever it drops, is fucking awesome, man. I expect it will be. So, there you have it. And that is my ranking of all things Deicide. So, yeah, going into this, I was kind of dreading it, considering I was never a huge fan. But going through everything, there are now three or four more albums I really, really, really enjoy that I plan to get in the collection. So, yeah. More respect for DSI Musical, even though still not a huge fan of the lyrical themes just because it's just redundant. But that's just my opinion. What are your guys' favorite DSI albums? Let me know in the comments below. And until next time, which the final discography ranking that I am doing in 2022 will be December, The Mighty Black Sabbath. And if you thought that, say, the typo ranking was the hard, you ain't seen shit yet, because Black Sabbath... Oh my god, 20 albums, it's gonna be hell, but it's gonna be fun. But until then, horns high, see you guys later.
Better go in hell. What? Oh my god. That was a fail. <laughs> oh my god. Fuck that. <laughs> God, I am such an idiot! That was the dumbest thing I've ever done in this fucking game! <laughs> Why? What was that? Was I colorblind for a second? What was that?